and gentlemen, the three knockdown rule is in effect. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Mario Morris De Lopez. You know why? Because you got the time. <laughs> <laughs> Found the time to do I, the podcast. I do got the time. I made the time. Yeah, I made the time. And our right Jerome, <laughs> our Jerome. Oh, give me a little, give me a little dance back there, What's Nichols. Up, guys, I don't know who Jerome is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, he's, he's, he's much, much younger than he's, you a, millennial. Uh, he's a millennial. Watch Purple Rain, okay? <laughs> Netflix and chill with that. Anyway, we got a lot of things to talk about. Uh, next week, we are not going to do a show though. This is the Super Bowl edition of the Three Knockdown Rule. But let's go back. Mm. January 18th, Saturday, PBC on Fox from Philadelphia. Uh, the upsets continue, and it went bananas, literally. Jason Rosario with a TKO and five over Julian Williams. He is now your WBA and IBF 154-pound title. Mario, I thought Rosario was a pretty solid fighter. 7-0-1 since his loss to Nathaniel Gallimore. He had beaten Justin Deloach and Jamonte Clark. You know, one thing that stood out, though, Mario, man, he looks so much bigger than J-Rock. Physically, when he landed that uh, big right hand, I was like, "Oh, yeah. to get things going." So that that's what's great about boxing. We've had so many upsets, like you mentioned earlier. It keeps it exciting. It, it keeps it fresh. It makes it um, when you're more evenly matched. Things like this uh, tend to happen. It is considered an upset, but it's going to be. It's going to be interesting to see what happens from here. I believe Williams has a rematch clause, clause so he'll probably want to exercise that right Are away. Are you sure about that? Really? I'll be honest with you. Looking at that fight, and I've watched it three times, there are certain guys, as Duke would say, he's all wrong for us, baby. But yeah, don't he, don't you get that feeling? But I think because Williams was the favored going in, only thirty to one. Exactly, he was <laughs> such a heavy favorite going. In, I think just mentally, he's gonna write it off to you know what? I had a bad night. I got caught. I got caught. No way it could happen again. I'm getting right back on that horse, a la Joshua with Ruiz, okay? And I will write the ship. But I don't know if it'll be such an easy uh, horse to get back on. I really think highly of Julian J. Rock Williams and his trainer, Stephen Breadman Edwards. But unfortunately, it's one of these careers. Julian Williams is 29-2-1. He's been a world champion, unified champion. Unfortunately, his career will be defined by the two losses to Jamal Charlo mm. and Jason Rosario. And what do they say? Once is an aberration, twice is a trend. Is it fair to say that Williams is a tad shinny, that the punch resistance is not exactly elite? I mean, I don't know, because again, he's going up against guys that can that can punch, and sometimes guys just have luck not on their side. We just talked about this on our last podcast. He always seems to be on the wrong end of uh, the decision for him. Badu Jack, for example, comes to mind. Guys always in there, close fights. It looks like but he's he never get gets stopped, though. That's the difference. He does no, he doesn't get stopped. That's true. But I think with Williams too, it's not like he's he, it's not like he's not a. a, a, a a world-class guy. I think the guy no, that can fight. But at that level and with these guys with heavy hands, that's just what's going to happen. It just hasn't gone his way. Bananas Rosario is only 24 years old. And so, look, the Gallimore fight, he may have grown from it. And I've always said, when you see Samson Lekowitz in the corner, who's an international agent, he's the guy that discovered Sergio Martinez and a guy by the name of Manny Pacquiao. This He's got guy, a good eye. He's got yeah. an eye. So when, when you see him in the corner, you're like, huh. This guy's not here to lay down and play dead. Right. And here's what I thought was very noticeable. You're right. Julian Williams in the first round was sharper, quicker, straighter off the trigger. Right. But when they hit each other, Rosario moved back Williams. You could just tell it, the force of the punches, and then the cut on J-Rock, and he didn't react very well. Look, this is what I mean about why I respect certain fighters that can hold a title for 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 fights. Because the great fighters can consistently beat solid guys over and over again. And that was a big question with Brian Valori. He was a four-time champion. He never held a title for more than one or two defenses. Well, that's what the big difference is. They say it's obviously uh, extremely difficult to become a champion. It's even tougher to stay a champion. There's no soft touches, yeah. really, after that. Unless, no, there really isn't. Even if you are a megastar and they're going to match you, maybe a little soft. But you're fighting guys that are, you know, for the most part, extremely well-prepared. They recognize their opportunity, and if you are a guy that's able to, to defend more than a handful of times, then that's pretty special. I mean, these sandwich fights are very tough, and that was a tough fight to take for Julian Williams. Gut feel, because look, Williams was slated to fight Jermel Charlo, the WBC champion, sometime mm. in June. Uh, as they say, the best laid plans of mice and men. Gut feel, Rosario, J-Rock 2. Who do you tab in the rematch? I think Rosario would have to be the favorite going in even he was yeah. even though he was such a big underdog 
because in the fashion in which he knocked him out, he's young, he's got a lot of momentum, he's going to have a lot of confidence going in there, uh, and now it's his title to lose. I think Williams will have to stand and actually trade a little bit more to, to steal mm. some of those rounds, mm, and that's mm, not going to mm. bode well. So I think Rosario, you got to lean towards. I'm going to go double bananas. I, I think Rosario is just too big, too strong. He seems like the streaking fighter. But again, one thing we know about Julian Williams, very resilient psychologically. Uh, on this undercard for the interim WBA 130-pound championship, uh, young prospect Chris Colbert got some valuable experience against Jezreel Corrales. Didn't look spectacular. But again, against Corrales, you're generally not. Also on this night, Saturday night on ESPN from my Verona, New York, light heavyweights in action. The Storm, Eladel Alvarez, with a highlight reel knockout of Michael Seals. I thought class Ooh. and experience showed. Look, Seals was coming on a nice little streak, but you could tell who was seasoned at the world-class level. Well, the thing about Alvarez, he's like a strong, sturdy guy. He's got a hell of a chin. Yes. There's some big punchers there. And talk about a pretty right hand. Ooh. Ooh, they both threw him at the same time. His got there first and ooh, connected. Yep. Man, that was nice. So he's bounced back nicely since that uh, second fight with, with Kovalev. And he, he's a dangerous guy. He's got to be one of the meanest looking dudes when you just look at him in the grill. He looks like a video game character he, or a he, Bond villain, he doesn't does. he? He does. He straight out looks like a villain. Like, he, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to cross that dude. And uh, Michael Seals had scored some, like I said, eye-opening knockouts. But you kind of tell as he got in there. It was like that kid that just took his first couple of swimming classes being thrown out to the deep end of the pool. You could tell. They, he didn't feel very comfortable right. swimming. With Canelo Alvarez dumping the WBO 175-pound title, they have kind of announced this tournament where Alvarez is slated to face Gilberto Zerto Ramirez. That's an interesting now, fight. I don't know if that happens given what's going on with Zerto, but I have to tell you right now, I just get the sense that Ramirez hasn't fought since April. Mm. He's only had one fight at 75. I like Alvarez in this matchup. You can't. So do I if they're fighting next. If he has another fight prior to that and, you know, assuming he's able to work some rust off and two solid camps, then okay. Then I think he's disciplined enough. He, he's he got the skill set to be able to win. But that is a dangerous fight at any point when you take it. The co-feature on this night, Felix Verdejo, is first journey under the eye of Ismael Salas with a 10-round decision over Manuel Ray Rojas. Mario, um, I like Verdeo. I think he's very marketable, but I just wonder, is it too late to, ch to not, not teach an old dog new tricks, but this dog new tricks? He just doesn't seem comfortable inside the pocket. Yeah, I don't know what it's been with these last um, few Puerto Rican fighters that are supposed to be the next big thing. There was Verdejo. There was Verdejo. There was Juan Ma Lopez, and they were supposed to be the next big yeah. things. And they went up against some buzzsaws at some point. Uh, in reality, hit him in the face, and they we haven't seen that the character that uh, are they're able to to recover from that and kind of move on. I'm not saying Verdejo will, will not, because you could tell the kid. Um, there's some tools. There's some tools. He's there. long. He's got right. He's got some quickness. He's athletic. Sure. Above average power. But one thing I noticed about him. Everything is a jab, jab, and then the right hand, and he won't whip around the hook on the inside. So by the time he works his way inside the pocket, he's already pulling back out. And I'm like, well, no, stick there. There's safety inside the pocket once in a while, and I think that's the next step. I, I really think if you're going to make this thing work and you're not going to rush it, because I think Ismail Salas brings some professionalism. Mm -hmm. He's also at a real gym. He's out of the Puerto Rican gym where he was the oldest guy by 10 years. I've been there, and I was like, he's the only adult, Felix. Mm -hmm. It's like Carlos Balderas. If you're the biggest fish in the sea your whole life you're never going to grow no and stagnant. so that that's where sparring is important and i look i like verdeo i think he's very very marketable but i saw some things that i liked and some other things i'm just thinking can you ever really improve that uh, but the journey will continue for el diamante mario wednesday the news broke i was able to speak to manny robles who unfortunately has parted ways with andy ruiz Mario, I have to tell you, the Cinderella story of 2019 by 2020 became the cautionary tale. I feel bad for Manny Robles. I do, too. And and look, I don't think you can blame Manny for anything with this last uh, fight and the, and the results of it. Manny didn't eat his way into 30 pounds uh, being heavier for on Andy's side. Um, I think he owes Manny a lot. Now, here's the, now here's the approach, I think. I think just the optics of changing trainers. Um, I feel the brain trust, whoever this Heyman, whoever, feels like, okay, look, we're, we're, we're showing that we're going to be in a new environment with a new trainer. Um, it's going to reinvigorate 
this this career and jump started. And I think they hope that perception will be the case with Ruiz. I think you are who you are. You hear you hear rumors of like him with like a Teddy Atlas. And we'll get into that. Or so, you know, and like. I've, Teddy's always my, my kind of trainer. I like hard-ass Marine-style kind of traders because I like somebody to be on my ass. But that's my personality. I like that. Ruiz is is not that kind of guy. He's, he's he, you know, he'll show up when he's going to show up. Freddie Roach is a guy, like, you know, he adapts to guys. A little who bit kinda, more mellow. A little more mellow. He comes in as long as you do the work. But not uh, – Teddy's a very regimented guy. So maybe uh, uh, a change of scenery will, will, will help. Kind of like Gennady Golovkin. He um, – Abel Sanchez didn't do anything wrong per se or didn't have a bad camp. Just I think they feel like a whole new team, which sucks for the trainer. Years of loyalty and getting you to that. You're just quickly disposed. It's just it's just an unfortunate wrinkle in this game. Uh, I wrote on late Wednesday night about this parting of ways. I was able to talk to Manny Robles. Uh, This is what he had to say. And I asked him to begin. Was this an amicable split? Uh, you, you know, I mean, I seen it coming. I'm going to be honest with you. I seen it coming during camp. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, I saw it coming. I mean, there were, you know, Andy was just doing whatever the hell he wanted to do. And, and, uh, and, you know, the dad, obviously him being the manager slash dad, he, he just had no control over his son, you know? Yeah. And the, none of us had any control over him for that matter. So, so I just saw it coming. I saw, you know, this isn't going to work, you know, because he's not listening. You know, he's not listening to me. He's not listening to his dad. He's not listening to anybody. He said it himself after the press conference. You know what? I, I blew it. I, uh, after the fight, I'm sorry, at the press conference, I blew it. I, I didn't train. I didn't prepare. He apologized to me, to the dad, because he knew he, you know, he, he knew he, he fucked up. And, uh, so I just, I figured, okay, it's only a matter of time. You know, yeah. it's only a matter of time before I get the call. And, and and you know, lo- lo- fortunately for me, you know, Andy said, Andy and Andy took the blame on himself, you know, and, and didn't have to sit there like the majority of fighters do and, 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 and blame, blame the coach. You know what I mean? Manny, did you get paid, though, at least for all your services and your work? Yeah, I mean, I got paid. Mm-hmm. I mean... You know, did I get paid what I thought was right? Maybe not, but yeah, I got paid, you know? You know, I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, shit, you know? I mean, I'm okay. I'm still here. What was the you know? reasoning, according to the father, as he met with you, for their decision? Well, well, that, exactly that, that it was the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, I guess you can say it was Al Heyman's decision. It was uh, PBC's this, or the people, you know, the, the people promoting him, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, he said that it was their decision, and and it wasn't it wasn't Andy's, it wasn't the dad's. That it was their decision, and that they they asked them to that that they told they, they apparently, apparently they told them that that uh, they couldn't have the same thing repeat itself again. That's what the dad said. You know what we can? They said they they can't have the same thing repeat itself again. So, you know, uh, 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 they had to uh, they had to move on. You know, Manny, do you feel yeah. as though you're being unfairly scapegoated here? Uh, yeah. I mean, it. You know, it, it is what it is. I mean, I I don't know what to tell you. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it's it's not the first time this happens to me, and I'm sure it's not the first time it happens to you know to to other coaches. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it happens time and time again. We always end up getting the short end of the stick, but but it is what it is. I mean, what are you, you going to do? You keep mm-hmm. moving forward. You know, you 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 try to, uh, 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 you know, just I, I don't know how to put it. I mean, me, I just keep pushing. I'm, I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. I'm going to be at the gym again, and I'm and I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, stop. You know, let this stop me or, 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 or feel any, any, any different about, about the sport, about boxing. I mean, and, you know, I love, I love boxing and it, and it isn't, you know, all oh, boxing, boxing is a, it's a brutal sport. It's, it's a brutal sport, but, you know, uh, but it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, you know, these type of situations have nothing to do with boxing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's people. 
Boxing, now, I love boxing. Now, again, as I said, it's got nothing to do with the sport and everything to do with people, you know. So, and, Manny, and, going yeah. through this whole year, 2019, I mean, there's some highs and some lows. Do you still look at this as a great experience or as a good experience? To oh, man, back? Man, look absolutely. Back I, look, I, I got to tell you, man, I'm absolutely grateful and and I'm blessed and grateful to have been able to experience Everything I was able to experience in 2019. I mean, we made history. Mm-hmm. And, and I have to be thankful for that. I have to be thankful to, to Andy and, and his dad and for giving me the opportunity, uh, uh, to, to, to be part, to make, to be part of uh, something special, to be, have made history, you know, uh, for him to be, become the first Mexican heavyweight champion of the world. I really believe that, uh, coming into the second fight that, you know, that we were going to be able to do it again, but obviously you can't do that if you're, if the fighter, if the fighter isn't there, if the fighter doesn't, doesn't, doesn't want it. You know what I mean? I did everything I could as a coach, uh, as a, as a coach, as, as a teacher, as a friend. But, uh, again, as I said, if, if the fighter, if, a, if the fighter's not there, what do you do? So there it is, the words of Manny Robles. Let me just say this. Look, I like Andy. I think he's a friendly, personable guy, but I've said this before to you, Mario. I don't think he has any passion for the sport. I think he likes what boxing can bring him. I think it keeps him from having a real job. And he, I'm just telling you again, he reminds me of that lottery winner. And you know what they say about most lottery winners? Within five years, they're back to their same economic state. Mm-hmm. It, it just has that look. And like even when you go on social media with, with Andy with the Fashion Nova post, you're like... <laughs> Dude, oh, like, it's just a bad look. It just doesn't seem right. And to me, look, I it, told it, this to it, Manny a couple of weeks ago because he had a feeling this was coming. He said, Steve, I don't know what's going on. I said, Manny, there was no way you could have quit even if you wanted to because you waited your whole life for this score. Of course. And in situations like that, you know what Manny really got paid for? For lying. Because there's no trainer that's ever going to tell you, oh, we're having a terrible camp. My guy's not showing up. We're going to get – no, you can't. But for a guy like Manny, you need this payday. You want this payday. You've earned the payday. Mm-hmm. But he knew right off the bat, he said, oh, I may not be here. Now, I said earlier how it's difficult, obviously, to become a champion, even harder to stay a champion. But a big part of that is discipline. And I think that's, that's a skill, by the way. Well, that's what I think Andy really lacks. And the maturity. Discipline and maturity. Because if you were mature enough to recognize the opportunity that, hey, if I train hard and am able to pull another victory off, I could now be a $25, $30 million He would have knocked off Canelo as right. the Mexican franchise fighter. In but my instead, he was that took a really long victory lap. Manny, unfortunately, and who knows if Andy really wanted to do it. I, I'm not saying it's in whole. Ultimately, yeah, it is his, his call. But who knows if, if Heyman, whoever was in his head, say, hey, listen, just perception-wise. I know you love and by the way. I don't think Heyman had anything to do with this. I've talked to people that have had fighters with Heyman. I don't think Heyman is that type of guy like George Steinbrenner. Maybe, to be maybe not. Maybe, I, really no, 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 I just no. think they're using that as a convenient excuse. Maybe, maybe, and, and, and he's old, but maybe he, maybe someone got in his ear and he's like, hey, you know what? Maybe a new scenery is what's gonna wake me up. Right? I need to be inspired. But do you believe again. a coach's job is to motivate? Do you? No. no well, <laughs> it depends on your subject, man. I mean. Sometimes there's guys that are just like, they're blessed with like an abundance of talent, but they don't have the drive, right? Look, that's why I, I go back to like a Pacquiao, a Canelo, champions who have continued to improve. They have the right cra- stuff. They have the right stuff, but they improve, continue to improve in their craft as champions. That's rare. Because you know what Chuck Noll once said? You know, he won four Super Bowls. He said, if I ever have to give you a motivational speech, especially before a big game, I'm going to get a new player. Because you're in the wrong business. Yeah, you no, you're exactly pros. right. Spe- and look, you don't have the luxury to work, rely on anybody else. That's an individual sport. It's all you. Now, uh, you brought up Teddy Atlas. I know for a fact that they have reached out to Teddy Atlas. I'm being told by someone in the Ruiz camp they're going to go out to New York and have a trial period. Can I just say something to some network out there? Please buy the rights because this is a reality show that I think people would be fascinated by. I've known Teddy Atlas for 20-some-odd years. He taught me a lot about the game. He's someone that I really do look up to in a lot of ways. He makes Bobby Knight look like a player's coach. He is, I, th- he, I don't think it, that it's Andy not, is not his type of guy. 
I'm just telling you, New- that would be fascinating to watch. It'd be a disaster. And New York is not his type of state. There's no good Mexican food out there. He's going to be looking for tortas and burritos. They're going to be whack as hell. He's going to be screwed. Okay. Okay. They need tortas and burritos yeah, right no, now, No, but wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. That is actually a very there. good, good point. point. That's no, a very but, good point. But I will look. Andy, throughout his career. You don't career, have to weigh anything yeah. as a heavyweight. You don't, you don't, you don't have to cut weight. But Andy yeah, true. has always been based in Southern California or Las Vegas. Don't you think he needs to get out of the comfort zone, though? Because I really believe this, though. Certain fighters do need to be sequestered away. Now, I don't know how he would adjust to being 3,000 miles away. And I know the way Teddy runs camp. Again, he's not a player's coach. It is lockdown. Yeah. And unlike Manny, it, that's what Teddy he needs. would say, I'm out of here. That's he what he needs, ironically. You think that's what he wants, though, really? That's, but that's what I was just going to say. That's what he needs, but I don't know if that's what he wants. Because I don't know if, again, he's mature enough to recognize it. or He's disciplined to see it through. Looking at the reaction of social media to this news, I have to tell you, Andy is getting drugged. Hmm. I mean, drugged. Well, dude, all the Ross are so disappointed, man. And they want us, look, they don't want to see the Fashion Nova post. They want to see him already back in the gym, have his trainer figured out, him losing some weight. They want to see him serious. I think he could come back and win. You think so? No, hold on, and win people over. And at least have him cheering for him if he shows some maturity and some discipline and sees that he's serious and really has has learned from this. Whether that's a reality, I don't know. And I just want to say <laughs> one thing about Manny Robles, the way he's handled this, what he went through, that I think fighters would be very lucky to have him in their corner and that he'll come away from this uh, enriched in a lot of different ways. I don't think this hurts his reputation. I thought it said a lot, Mario, that when they won the fight on June 7th, I think, I remember calling him. On that Sunday, he was at a Kennedy Airport, and he said, oh, I got to get home. I got to get back to my fighters on Monday. And I said, well, wait a minute. You're not taking a day off? He said, Steve, my other fighters, they have important fights, too, to them. They're important to me also. Meanwhile, Andy Ruiz, he didn't see him for five months. Come on. Dude, well, okay. Or so, at least three or four. So Teddy is, is one example, and Freddie Roach is yet another, who there's whispers yeah. him. I used to see him at Wild Card back in the day. Yeah. Freddie has a personality that's a little more suitable for Andy. In the sense that, look, he'll be a little flexible with when you roll in, but then when you're there, it's it's time to work. I, I think he'll have mm. some good sparring. I think the atmosphere there might help. I just think it's a little more doable and practical than him going to New York and being with Atlas. So I a think a Freddie, I, Freddie alliance would make more sense. Do you not agree than an Atlas? Hold on. You're right about that, but that's all I'm saying. Those are the names that I'm hearing. So out of those recently, two, those are out of those two. Well, then, I'll add yeah. another name, but recently Freddie Roach has Louis Neri, Chavez Jr., and now you want to give him Andy Ruiz. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to call you Excedrin because right. he's got all sorts of headaches now. Yeah. <laughs> you really need that. I mean, come on. Well, listen, but he's a, he's the kind of guy that you know, would his, his, him to me. To, but his temperament, he can handle yeah, those he's kind good. of guys. But, that's what I'm but saying. Eddie Reynoso has been brought up. I spoke to a guy. You know guy. what? That's funny that you right. say that because that's another guy that if he's going to – okay. Yeah. Keep going. Now, on. here's what I was told about Eddie, who's the trainer of the year, very well-deserved. Yes. Hats off. Someone that works with Eddie through a fighter said, Steve, mm-mm. He goes, I'll say one thing about Eddie. People don't realize this till you're there. He's a disciplinarian. And that if he senses that your, your commitment level dips, he'll just say, nice knowing you get out of here. And all. Another factor is – But you know what? I think – to interrupt you for a second – I think having Canelo there and the fact that, that he's that he's a Mexicano too, uh, he might respect him uh, and be a little bit more inspired to to be disciplined. You think I, that matters to Andy? I don't. I, I mean, don't. I guess I want to believe it does. You know? Uh, yeah, Mario, I know you're, Mario, I'm optimistic. You're pessimistic. There's so. no Santa Claus. There's no Easter Bunny. There's no committed Andy Ruiz. I think Come you need on, to get man. over that. He is what he is. He's always yeah, but don't you don't you at least at the very least get motivated by the potential of the money you can make? He just made fifteen million. He didn't show up to work. You know what I've heard about people that make money? They always want more. They really? always want more. Really? So well, you, yeah, you, you think he has the drive of Warren? No, Buffett I'm saying I Bill hope Gates. he does. I'm not saying I'm. I'm saying I would like to believe he does. I know you throw everybody <laughs> to the wayside real quick. But I'm saying I want to believe he does because this is his last chance to ever potentially make that kind of money, which he could again. Yeah, I'm being told that he's going to come back in June or July. I, I but I am fascinated if if Andy actually packs his bags and says I'm going to give this Teddy Atlas thing seven to ten days. Wow, I'm. I hope, I hope someone is taping it. 
I wouldn't be upset. <laughs> I wouldn't be upset if he commits, and I, I wouldn't I, look at. I think any of those three, you, you can't go wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, w- with respect to Robles, both Atlas, Reynoso, and Roach. I, I think you can't go wrong with any of those three. And like I said, I hope Andy uh, realizes the, the timing remember, situation here. You can lead a horse to water. But you can't make them train. Anyway, moving on to the fight preview. It's showtime from the Barclay Center. Set your DVRs, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welterweight, Danny Garcia takes on Ivan Redcatch. And junior middleweight, Jarrett Thundering Herd comes back against Francisco Santana. And then Stephen Fulton, bright young junior featherweight, takes on Arnold Kagai. Mario, Garcia, Redcatch. I don't know what to really say other than, uh. um, <laughs> look, Garcia was supposed to fight Errol Spence. We know what happened in October. <sighs> I... I I'm going to watch it because I'm in the business. I tell you what fight I don't like is Hurd Santana. I love Chia Santana. He's a welterweight, and Jared Hurd's this huge 154-pounder. They're making this fight at 156. Mm. It's an absolute physical mismatch, but if it's on TV, I'm going to watch it. Mario, this show, Super Bowl Thursday, January 30th on The Zone in Miami, I think is the best early card of the first two, three months. WBO junior middleweight uh, middleweight titles on the line. Boo Boo Andrade takes on Luke Keeler, while Tevin Farmer defends his IBF 130 pound title against Joseph Diaz and unified 122 pound champion Danny Roman takes on Murjan Akhmadaliev. Now, in the corner of both Diaz and Akhmadaliev is famed trainer Joel Diaz. Now, Ma- Akhmadaliev is only seven in zero. And I asked Joel Diaz. What are the chances? Is the inexperience a factor for MJ? You know what? Akhmadaliev is, is is a tough kid. He's uh, I mean, he has a great pedigree, um, resume, amateur resume. You know, he was he will he won the bronze medal in the, in the Olympics. He's uh, he's fought every style, you know, uh, in his career. So you know, with only seven fights, uh, I honestly think that it's 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 a great opportunity. It's a great fight. You know, Danny Roman is a tough kid. You know, he's a workhorse, you know. He comes and he's always there. He's very consistent. So I think he's going to be a great fight. He's going to play out, he's gonna play out really well. Um, you know, it's, it's a good fight for, for the boxing fans. Uh, Asma Delio, even though he only has seven fights, and not a lot of people know him so well. He's not, he's not well known in the boxing world. But I think that after that fight, he's going to be known. Mm-hmm. And... You're in the corner of Joseph Diaz facing a very slick Tevin Farmer. Jo- Joel, it's my opinion that Joseph's got to be the fighter here. He's got to roughhouse it as much as he can. Do you agree with that? You know, uh, Jojo Diaz, uh, has, when he gets in the ring, even as even sparring, he has he has a temper. You know, he's very temperamental. Uh, and he takes no for an answer. He's going to be he's gonna be on Tevin all night. I know for a fact. That I mean, Tevin Farmer needs to be 100 percent in in top shape because Jojo Diaz is going to be on his face all night. It doesn't matter how fast he moves on his feet. Jojo is going to bring the pressure. Why? Because uh, we know that Tevin Farmer doesn't have the, the power to hurt Jojo. Mm-hmm. Jojo Jojo is going to rough him up, and he's going to bring it to him. So all I see is Tevin Farmer putting Jojo. Uh, and, and problems in the maybe the first three four rounds, honestly, because of of the speed and the footwork and stuff. But once Jojo Diaz gets adapted, uh, and you know just based on the pressure and the attack that you know that, that is coming into into play, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a big difference after the fourth round. So again, that is next Thursday, January thirtieth, in beautiful Miami, Florida, on the Zone. Very good card, top to bottom. Uh, let's go to the Ask Mario segment of the show. Uh, Mario, if Crawford and Conor McGregor were to fight in a boxing match, how how do you see that ending? Well, what do you think? I think the boxer would win. Well, Such yeah, by, by by devastating fashion, right? Too. I, I I think. Look, I actually think Floyd carried him for a while, and it took him a minute just because. He's a little older and, and, and maybe just in training. Carried started. him. His nickname should have been U-Haul. Yeah, exactly. Of course exactly. he carried yeah. him. Actually, I saw Floyd at a Laker game, and he actually told me, come on, you know I carried that fool, and he might have been whatever. Oh, but, well, uh, hey now, big but, story. Yeah, yeah. But, but, and, and the ref helped him out because he really could have knocked him out something, yeah. something bad had he not stopped. Because remember, he, he was on his way down. What he, do you think <laughs> of Aram's idea, though? I love Aram's idea. It's, it's so like bold that. and clever that uh, Terrence Crawford 
and Conor McGregor would sign a two-fight deal, one being an MMA fight, the other a boxing fight. And by the way, in case you don't know, Terrence Crawford has got a wrestling bra- background. He's got two sons that are studs. They're good. Wrestlers. They're good, and apparently by the way. Terrence wrestled. Uh, well, he's got a, I don't know if he did he. I thought I heard he wrestled. I've oh, seen maybe clips. His, I'm assuming maybe because yeah. his kids wrestled. I've seen clips where he's putting guys in holes in his camp. Yeah. He looks like he knows what he's doing. Well, listen, if he wrestled, even in high school, a little bit, his grappling, I'm sure, is enough to uh, You know why I think discourage that McGre- McGregor. The UFC guys better be careful of Crawford, though. He's got a different mentality than Floyd, though. He's a mean SOB. Oh, I know. He's ornery. And he's not there to play games. No, I he know. He cares about his reputation. And with those little four-ounce gloves? Oh, man. If he tries to stand oh. toe-to-toe? No, I would love that. I'd love to see that even more than Pacquiao McGregor, which I, is also rumored. I think there's two boxers that could actually make a little bit of a transition to the octagon. It'd be Crawford because of his wrestling background. You also had a wrestling background. Mike Alvarado. Uh, he, well, he began there, absolutely. Yeah, Gennady he was a Golo- champion. Of t- Gennady Gennady Golovkin. Golovkin had a wrestling yes, background, Yes, he did. Too? In fact, uh, Abel Sanchez says that when a- Andy Ruiz, at his weight, was in camp, he was wrestling with Golovkin. He said Golovkin pinned him. And Golovkin has that natural strength, and I guess yeah. in uh, that part of the world, they just they do a lot of combat stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, well, no, that makes sense. So they that are well rounded. Here's one from Ivan Arroyo, guys. Who were some of your favorite athletes growing up, boxing and non-boxing? Well, boxing in the era. Well, yeah. Chavez was your guy. Chavez, Tyson, all those guys grow. But he, but even um, I, I love seeing um, Ray Leonard, and and uh, you know my dad is a little little kid. Yeah. Burns and Duran, that whole era and stuff, and I mean, there's so many. Obviously, non-boxing. I think the the the, the same the same era, right? Joe Montana, Michael Jordan, hmm. um, the Lakers guys at the time, all the uh, the uh, Valenzuela and the Dodgers, Fernando. Yeah, hmm. so there, you know, I mean, it's hard to pick those. Uh, for me, my Mount Rushmore was Eric Dickerson. He was on my. So uh, well, I was a Ram fan growing up. I was an absolute Ram fan. You're not one anymore. When they moved in '95, uh-huh. they died to me. I don't care if they came back. You're dead to me. Get out of here. Oh, well, you know what? I like that. I respect that. Yeah. I, when they won the Super Bowl in '99, I hated it. To see Georgia Frontieri lift the Lombardi, I literally, I had, I got an ill feeling. And you haven't adopted one since, huh? No. You should. I, you should. Have I just like heard? the NFL. Watch the Miami Hurricane guys. You should That's consider it. the Chargers. Uh, they need fans. Yeah, every <laughs> single one of them. Yeah. Another one that I really love was Tony Gwynn, Mr. Padre. In fact, I like. I like. I love Tony Gwynn too. I was such a he, big yeah. Tony Gwynn. I was a Dodger fan, fan but I love. I Gwynn. used to make a schedule. Yes. Um, with the boxes, of road and away games, just like the pocket schedule. I used to make a bigger version. Best and, natural hitter. Yeah. Since it's Ted the, Williams. And so really? what I would do every day I'd read the sports page, and I used to write down his box score. Yeah. It'd be right on my bed. So if I looked at my bed growing up in Montebello, yeah. if I wanted to see how he did April 25th in Philadelphia, I could see, oh, he went two for four with the st- – I mean, that's how big of a Tony Gwynn fan was I was. gold lover, too. He won, he won four or five gold gloves, and he once stole 52 bases. Before he started looking like the Padre logo, he that's was actually right, yeah, a guy was, that could he, run a little bit. He was bit. a point guard in San Diego State. All-time assist Can guy. you believe that? Wow. Yeah. Dude, what the hell would that be? And, and uh-huh. an all-time great Afro in Jerry Curl. So this guy was very well rounded. Yes, There's no yes, doubt. Yes. The other guy that I really Chargers liked, too, of course, Dan Fouts back Steve in the Steve Garvey, when I was a Dodger yeah. fan, I was I was actually was named after Padre Steve. Too. Yes, he was. You were named after Steve Garvey? How so, did I not know that? Yeah, because <laughs> Steve and because my mom that was her favorite player. And then the funniest joke when he started getting uh, women uh, pregnant, they said Steve Garvey's not my Padre. That was a famous bump. Yeah, of course, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> that was a good one. That and then funny. and then later on, the guy that really turned me into a Miami Hurricane fan was the playmaker Michael Irvin. Michael Irvin. And then anyway, Catch a baby in the dark. Yes, he could. It was thrown by uh, Troy Aikman, absolutely. Yeah. Here's one from Jason T., my oh, guy. Real quick, before we move on, since we mentioned the Chargers, yeah. what are your thoughts? We'll start flurrying it real quick. Your thoughts on Tom Brady possibly being a Charger? I believe, based on the evidence and the news that's coming out, <laughs> it looks like Brady's out of New England. Well, let's assume he's a Charger. What are your thoughts? Would you I would welcome do it. that? I would do it. Really? Even because a 43-year-old Brady, You have huh? a big stadium that's yeah. going to look very empty. You need – no, I, 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 I want to tell you, I won't look empty because it's still a destination city. Even though, And that's the Rams too, by the way. People always will, uh, will travel when it's freezing in Green Bay or Cincinnati and they want a road game. They'll go to L.A. you got a brand-new stadium that's an attraction yeah, in itself. It's a lot itself. bigger than that band box you guys were playing in. Which, There's by the way, I wish we stayed there. That place is awesome. 50,000 more seats, That Mario. place is awesome, though. I wish it stay, they'd stayed the, we stayed there. It's awesome. I, so you like it. You're a fan. Yes, because I. if you surround them with better players and you got Gordon there and you got some good receivers, Mike Williams, look, the Patriots did not give him a lot of you help. You got good receivers. You got yes. like not tight end. He's right. good. So, good pass rush. Yeah. Put it this way. The Chargers, we've discussed this. 
they lost all their games by less than seven points. Or seven points or less. Yeah. They were 12 and four the season before. Isn't like, that crazy? Yeah. The seven same roster, or essentially. Less. And you know what? Those games, they were seven, most of them were seven points or less, too, but we won those. Yeah. And so this one's yeah. just so you never and know. And again, Phillip Rivers was a turnover machine. Say what you want about Brady. He protected the ball. Yep. That makes a huge okay, difference. So you'd rather have him than Cam Newton. Yes, from a ticket selling perspective, because if I'm the Chargers, I say, do I need to be, do, if I want a one year stopgap, I'd much rather have Brady. Yeah. Because I don't know if, if, if Cam's willing to be a bridge quarterback hmm. when you draft another guy. Right. That's just my view of it. Okay. Here's one from Jason T. 2019 was called the year of the upset. 2020 already giving us more of the same. Do you think this trend may be related to the fact that a lot of these guys just aren't fighting often enough to stay elite level sharp? Or is it just a weird and welcome anomaly? I've said for years, these guys aren't sharp. I, I agree with Jason. I think they're not. Yes, I agree with them. And I also think or I'd like to think that the matchmaking is getting a little better, too. Yeah, to a certain degree. To a certain degree. But when a guy has to fight once or twice a year, and a lot of these guys don't stay in great shape, and I'm not saying that's the case with Julian, look, a lot of these guys have to reacquaint themselves to getting yeah, hit. That's true. And I think that's a factor. Here's one from Javier Lopez. I understand fighting Murata in Japan would make Canelo's brand bigger, but this ain't even a close matchup, or am I wrong? What do you think about... Uh, Canelo going to the land of the rising sun. I love it. I think it's great for him. I think it's great branding. for the sport and the branding. Exactly. I think he should fight him in Japan. He should fight Saunders or um, Callum Smith and uh, the UK. All the above. Yeah, because I, I'm kind of over the whole Cinco de Mayo Mexican Independence Day being at the MGM Grand and the T-Mobile Arena. It just feels so cookie cutter. I know. It's tough when they throw that money at you, but um, by the way, they're looking at a UK fight with either a Callum Smith or a BJ Saunders, or a BJ Saunders which wouldn't be mad at any of those. Um, here's a one from RTID. You guys go with top rank quote unquote going there with the boxing versus MMA talk. You know, here's the thing that's interesting is both Bob Arum and Oscar a couple years ago as Connor fought Floyd, they made a lot of comments ripping it. Mm -hmm. Now they're kind of like, well, you know, look, look, that's why what, what happens if you live in a glass house? Exactly. Don't throw left hooks. <laughs> <laughs> just don't. Just be quiet. Let people make their money and mind your damn business. That's I'm the here way. for it, too. It's fun. I think those are fun novelty uh, circus shows. <laughs> well, no. Actually, if a world-class boxer decided to go to the octagon, that would actually interest me. Because I think those guys are such fishes out of water. I think it's a terrible idea, to be honest with you. Well, unless you have a wrestling background, then I think it makes right, it a little, a little bit Right. That's a little bit different. Uh, so we move on to the final flurry section of the three knockdown rule. Steve Kim, Mario Lopez, uh, Mr. Lopez, Conor McGregor made a successful return, short and sweet against the Cowboy. Did we learn anything? We learned that Conor's still the uh, consummate uh, entertainer in the sport. He's good uh, for the sport. Um, he looked great, but he was up against a guy that was tailor made for him in Cowboy and a guy who's never been able to rise to the occasion when he's had the opportunity and a guy who just got is coming off two knockout losses. Yeah. So it was a perfect opponent for the situation. And the weird thing is, though, you usually see Cowboy at least put up a fight. He didn't throw a punch, Kim. He didn't throw a punch. Is it true he the missed... shoulder broke his nose? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what they're saying. Jeez. The shoulder with, with the way he was... Um, uh, uplifting his shoulder into his nose, but then Cowboy, when he missed that big right hand, he launched or big left hand. I should say, he launched from the beginning. I thought he was going to wrestle with him and take him down. He just, he just, he looked completely just out of it. Um, with that said, I don't know if Connor wants to stay at the welterweight division, which is 170. That's what they call their welterweight. Is there ever going to be a rematch with my third cousin from Mongolia, Khabib? Or Habib? <laughs> No, is he not Does, is he from Angola? Is he okay, from whatever. But, whatever he's right, yeah. But don't you think there's unfinished business? Well, I don't know if he wants to a, a part of that, to be honest with you. And that have to be he'd have to go back to a one fifty five, which I think is. And better, for the safety of class. the fans, would they have to put a moat around the octagon just to make <laughs> no, sure? No, he happen? said he wants to fight him back in Russia. He said he wants to fight him Russia. Um Really? Yeah. That's I, it, wild, look, man. Khabib's got a tough fight with Tony Ferguson. Okay, I've heard of that Bukui. guy. No, that's the that's the that's the badass fight right there. But against the other guys in the division, Kamaru Usman, Colby Covington, um, even Jorge Masvidal, I think Connor is the underdog at the one seventy. Wow, position. is that because these guys are good, or you think Connor's faded? No, because and I don't know if Connor's faded so much. No, it's because those guys are good and those guys are naturally bigger. I, I know one weight, thing. Look, and I'm not a big UFC guy, but I'm watching fights with some friends, Doug Fisher included, and we know that you know we're. 
watching boxing. I had to do the ringside report for ESPN. But I just know this, in terms of the social media and internet buzz, I couldn't help but note it. I, I guess Connor's fighting because like, it dominated oh, yeah. everything yeah. on that particular Saturday. I'm thinking, this guy is huge. No, he is. He is. You know who's huge? Zion Williamson. Did you see my boy make his debut yesterday? God, he's a star. He's, a big, he's, he's already among the top three or four guys that if he's on TV in the NBA, you just can't help but watch this kid. And he's got a likability too. But he looked a little... I don't know if he looked pudgy. 100%. No, pudgy. Well, no, no, not pudgy. I don't mind that. But he just looked a little gimpy still. I didn't know if he yeah. was 100%. I'd be like, very careful if I'm yeah, New Orleans. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. When I he would was put him landing on that one leg. I was like, ooh. I would make sure that he only plays a certain amount of minutes. I don't care what his stats are. Mm -hmm. I think he's too valuable to this organization after they had lost Anthony Davis. Look, from Anthony Davis to Zion, pretty good transition. Mm -hmm. And that team looks to be exciting. If this kid could ever really get a touch from the outside, man, he's going to be good. Well, he had he was four for four, I think, from the outside. Yeah. He only made three. Um, he had this two minute stretch it, over Duke. <laughs> yeah, more. He's got more three pointers than Ben Simmons has in his whole career. Wow, talk <laughs> that, that's not a good look for Ben Simmons. Mar, you know what's sad, and I don't want to joke about this. This upcoming Saturday will mark basically one year since Adrian Broner. Fought Manny Pacquiao, fight that I covered. I believe that was January 26th of How much money did he make at that fight? He made about, I think, four to five million. But my understanding is they Good took money. a lot of advances, so they take that back. Oh. Nothing's ever free in boxing. Now he's out there putting messages, I think, on Snapchat or was it Instagram? Hey, I'm having some tough times. If everyone just donate ten dollars, I'd appreciate it. I'm like, my God, you went from prize fighting to panhandling. Thought it was in about one year. billions. Now he's about broke. About begging. About that. But I don't want to joke about it. But I'm just saying, what is going on there? I don't want to joke yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, As I joke. Yeah. Um, by the way, Tank Davis, I saw a story in TMZ, always a great news for a news source. I guess he bounced a check to a jeweler oh for God. a quarter million. Here's my question. Who takes checks anymore? You know, I'm the last guy to carry cash. You always tell me that. Do you actually ever write checks anymore? I can't tell you last time I wrote a check. But what are you <laughs> buying for a quarter million? That's the bigger, bigger question. Ice, what, man. What, the drip. On, the man. drip. He's the faucet. Yeah, have, the you seen, have you seen Uncut Gems with uh, Adam Sandler? No. Kevin Garnett's very good in that. Okay. Uh, by the way. But it's essentially about these, you know, these guys coming in with a jewelry. It's yeah. amazing. I've never, I've never got that. Why? It's Does just, jewelry it's, depreciate or appreciate, though? Like, I know a car, as soon as you drive it off, it's 50% what it's worth. But is there any piece of jewelry that you could buy and then five years later, like, flip it, for lack of a better word? I mean, well, yeah, if it's something like a Super Bowl ring or something, of value, you know, the, yes. But And diamonds hold their value if they've— Because think about it, because the time. people invest in gold and silver, right? Uh, yeah, but, bro, it's, it's a gaudy— tacky look i think i mean it's just really yeah. over the top and there's much more ways to make solid investments you know i spoke <laughs> to ryan garcia a couple Who? days ago he is dead serious about facing tank and you know what's interesting and tank responded even, yeah and he said i've been quiet but when it's ready but when it's ready i'm gonna kill that kid it doesn't in mario no longer will i call it tiananmen square because when when me and tino a couple days ago went up to riverside to talk to the respected robert garcia and we're just talking, and yeah. he has no horse in the race. He says, right. you know what? I like Ryan's chances. And guess what? More and more people that I respect, they really believe Ryan right now is more than competitive against the tank. I like that fight. I like I like his height. I like his reach. The I think speed. he's dangerous early on, the speed. I don't like it right now, yeah. to be honest. I'd like two, three more fights prior. But I think he's on the right road. I think uh, – uh, the plan is he's fighting, of course, on Valentine's Day. Then after that, he's supposed to fight Linares. They're both on the same card. Yeah. I think we're going to learn a lot that day. That's a completely different fighter yeah. from Tank, but world-class fighter nonetheless. We'll see We'll see where he's really at. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to uh, talk about this since we're not doing a show next week. On Super Bowl Saturday from China on ESPN, Jose Ramirez will take on Victor Postal. Mario, oh, I'm going to say it right a, ooh, now. That's right. Another sandwich fight. Think about it. This guy's coming off this big victory over Mo Hooker. There's a talk of Josh Taylor. Mm. I know one thing about Post. I saw him twice. He's in great shape. And look, unless you're Terrence Crawford, who's ever had a good time or looked good against going Postal? It took Terrence Crawford a minute to figure out, too. Yeah, so. but he went the distance. No, right. That's what I'm saying. Oof, that's a fight that – what are the what, what are the odds right now? Um, I think Ramirez is the solid betting favorite. I don't think it's 30-1. to 1, But if there's money to be made in terms of value, because that's right. what you bet on – 
all the values with Postal. I think I it's a dangerous fight. That's going to be very interesting to see. I'm surprised they took it, to be honest. It is you. a mandatory. See, now, I thought they were going to take their other mandatory, Catterall, out of the U.K. I think it's a much easier style than Postal. And right. look, Postal now, I believe, is 36 or 37. He's not going to get five more chances. This is the last shot here. Right, right. So he's coming in focused and prepared. Yeah, so it. make sure you check uh, your local listings for that. And then Sunday, we're going to talk about this when it happens a couple days after. Oh, Nichols, how nervous are you who for the you, old who, soup? Who do the you, soup. Who do you like, Kim? We know who Nichols likes already, but who, do you, who are you leaning toward? The line's like one. I've never seen it like uh, that. One and a half, I think. I'm actually, Now, the Chiefs are favored, right? Yeah. I'm so surprised by that. I thought the Niners would be favored by about two or three. Just my view, and I'm not Greg Cosell, I, I'm not a coach or Dan Orlovsky, but the Niners seem like the more physical, well-rounded team. I, I actually think on a neutral field, they win the game. See, that's what I think, too, and I don't know if I was being biased just because— I can't stand the Chiefs, but and I like the Niners too. Why? But those, but those, oh, because the Chargers. Yeah, they're in the same division. You can't be as like rooting for the Red Sox and your Yankees fan. You can't do that. Yeah, but respect. So respect you that. know. So, but but, man, I love Bosa. That kid in that front four. Damn it, man. The trenches. Those guys are strong and physical, and they get to the quarterback. Um, you know, I I think if they're Physical and establish the tone early, that, then I really like their chances too. But I'm concerned if they fall behind for some reason because Garoppolo only throwing or completing yeah. six passes last yeah. week. That was just playoffs, though. Don't forget yeah. we came back from the Saints by 13 twice. Okay. In the Super okay. Bowl. They won okay. a game scoring nearly 50 points against Absolutely. New Orleans. So That's true. And by the way, Shanahan's just a savage. If he can I, run it down your throat, don't forget he's got the Mike Shanahan DNA in him. He will you know, embarrass you, know you all game. That's true. Hey, be a handoff king. Mike be a Shanahan handoff. used to give it to Trail Davis 40 yeah. times. Sherman, and props to Sherman fact, for coming back. He Trail huh? Davis' whole career part. You know, right? Um, but props to Sherman for coming back from that Achilles and really showing I'm I'm happy for him. The dangerous part about this game for I the am nervous, Chiefs though. Mahomes is savage. Is that the one yeah. way you disrupt a great passing offense is if you could rush four and drop seven. Yeah. You keep two safeties high. Now, when you start blitzing and you got that Kansas City track team. Well, that's the thing. Those that guys are be- fast as hell. <laughs> right. So that becomes an issue. But San Francisco can literally say four guys, go. Yeah. Now, I will say this, and I took some blowback. In my view, this playoffs has proved one thing. Lamar Jackson is this year's player of the year. But the player you want for the next dozen years is Patrick Mahomes. Absolutely. Of course. I don't even think it's close. I don't either. I think it's ridiculous. What do you mean? Who was going to argue with that? That seems obvious to me. Oh, you'd be surprised. (laughs) Really? That (laughs) seems obvious to me. I mean, I think Mahomes is probably going to go with four or five Super Bowls in his career. He may not win them all, but I think he'll have that many appearances. And Lamar's style, at the end of the year, he started getting banged up a little bit. That, That particular style of quarterbacking, which is almost like a college way of playing to a certain degree, it doesn't age well. Like, even Steve Young, who used to run, like, a 4-3 when he was at the LA Express, because I watched a lot of those games. Mm-hmm. By the time Bill Walsh and then George Seeper got him, he was a pocket guy that could run. It mm-hmm. wasn't run first and then will pass. And the funny thing about Mahomes is I don't know why he does not get credit, but he runs well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he runs he very plays well. He last week. Yeah, he just doesn't need to. Yeah, and I love Shanahan for one reason, and it, Justin talked about this. When you run the ball, you're never given credit for being like a visionary, bright genius. I have to tell you, when I'm watching that game, and that first touchdown was third and eight, and they ran a trap draw, which is an old school play. And then the other times they're running like these counters and these sweeps and the quick. They have more variety in their running game. I'm thinking to myself, this is actually very fancy. People don't realize how fancy and and, and, and KC. Remember, they were down 24-0 versus the Texans. Yeah. They were down 10-0 versus the Titans. They can't do that against. They the Niners. can't do that against the Niners. As I was saying, if they yeah. they can't do that against the Niners, I haven't looked forward to a Super Bowl like this in years. Yeah, I'm actually excited for the game itself. Oh for God, the game it's going to it's going to be good. Where are you watching it at? Um, my buddy Ernie's having a barbecue. Gonna have a good time. What? <laughs> what type of look is that? I didn't, I didn't want your ass over. Don't assume <laughs> I was inviting you. Don't assume I was inviting you. Um, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> One thing, seriously, don't you think America kind of wants Andy Reid, though? He's like the friendly uncle. Every, like, he's like Uncle Buck. I do like him. I want him right? to get a ring just think not this time. This, this yeah. time. Yeah, not <laughs> this time. All right, well, that's it for this week's edition. So, Mario, next week you are busy. What are you up to? Next week. You've been I'm, busy, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I was in Miami, uh, and now I have to go back. Um, Orlando. To Orlando. 
So flying across nice the country. city. What's going on, Orlando? I got to shoot Disney over there World. at the Universal Studios there. Right. So I got to go over there. for, And then that's it. That's the last trip for a while. So yeah. Thank God. So next week we are off. We, we loaded this show up. And we'll talk about the Super Bowl. We'll talk about Ramirez Postal. We'll talk yeah. about the show in Miami. So I want to thank everyone for joining us on behalf of Mario Morris Day and the Time Lopez <laughs> and Jerome <laughs> Nichols. This is Steve Kim saying goodbye, everybody.